let's, we'll not stand today. Take your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 12 with me. We're go, continuing this sermon series through, through Matthew, and we're looking at Behold the King, Matthew 12, verses 9 through 14. We're looking at this thought, what is your why for gathering? What is your why for gathering? Jesus is going to answer this as he's gathering together with a group of people in what I would consider a precursor to church gathering. Uh, I do need to make this disclaimer. The synagogue was not a church. Christ had not died yet. Christ had not risen yet. God, Christ had not empowered the church with the Holy Spirit yet. The church is the body of Christ. He died for it. He bled for it. What does that mean? In our local area, Faithway is the church. Faithway Baptist Church. Not the name, not the building. We don't even own the building. Hey, we could. We can give to own this building. And I think we should give to own a building. But can I tell you something? The building isn't a church. I think COVID helped us with something uh, just a few years ago. It helped us understand uh, that the church isn't a building that you meet in. It's the people who have been saved, who have obeyed the Lord in baptism, and they have consciously said, I'm committing my life to Jesus Christ in this locale this local area. So just as a disclaimer, the synagogue that we're going to read about here in verse 9 is not a, the church, but it is a gathering of people who wanted to hear from the Word of God for one reason or the other, who wanted to even sing. The synagogue sang songs too. I don't, I don't know if you realize that in the first century, even before. They would sing psalms, even hymns. They would sing songs to the God. Some of them would get up here like some and sing to themselves. But uh, they sang to God. And, and I understand that it was kind of a precursor to how we do church. And, and the Bible doesn't give us a certain order of service to follow. It doesn't give us a certain list of songs to sing. It tells us to meet together for the edification of the body. To, pro, to praise God. To sing and, and, and psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and edify one another. And so I want you to kind of get that in mind before we read this passage, because sometimes we interpret Scripture in our context, and there's going to be some implications for us today through this. The biggest one is, what is your why for being in church today? What is your why? Matthew chapter 12, verse 9, look at what it says. Matthew records for us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and when he was departed from thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? And they, that, they, this is the reason why they asked it, that they might accuse him. And he said unto them, What man uh, shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day? And will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much more, or how much then, is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath? Then saith he unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council. There's another church. A congregation of people called out to crucify Jesus. Here's what they counsel, how they might, say this with me, destroy him. Say that again, how they might destroy him. What's your why for gathering in church today? Lord, be with us as we look at this text, as we dissect it, as we, as we apply it to our life. We need your help. We have come together, we have gathered together, for one reason or another. God, direct us to a passionate reason. And that passion is you. That passion is our salvation through Jesus Christ. That passion is a desire to live out the gospel of Christ. Lord, that passion is to be compassionate towards others. Be with us now as we look at this text. In Jesus' name, amen. In this episode, and I, I say an episode because how many of you grew up watching TV series. How many? Of you, come on, let's Knight Rider. How many of you knew what Knight Rider was? Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. The Knight Rider was awesome. How many of you Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fans in here? 
Come on, I'm talking to the millennials and Gen Xers right now. Uh, how many of you, there's other ones, Teen Titans. Teen Titans, anybody? Nobody knows what that is? I know what that is. All right. Now, here's one. I don't necessarily like the theme or the plot or, or the thing. It's kind of funny, but my kids have gotten into The Last Airbender. How many know that one? All right, you guys know that one. My kids are on the last one, and I, and, and, and I don't like that show because it does a bunch of different earth, wind, fire stuff. Not the music group, but um, uh, but the different elements, and they go on to different things. And I don't like it because that, but it's entertaining, just like Star Wars. I, I think those are entertaining. But in each of those se seasons, or each of those TV shows, there are seasons. They're broken up into different seasons, and then there's episodes. So people in our day know what an episode is. If I tell them in this section of passage of Scripture, and, and I go into the high text, we don't really know what I'm talking about, right? So in this episode of the series that we're going through, uh, Behold the King, uh, we see two fractions fighting it out, duking it out. In fact, they're doing something pretty awesome. They're contending for the faith. Both are. Both are contending for the faith. You know that we are called to contend for the faith? Oh, Jude 3 tells us that uh, 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 in the last part of it, he says, It was needful for me to write to you and exhort you that ye should, be, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, I have seen that used in so many different ways in my Christian life. I've seen it used to, to say it's okay to uh, batter and beat somebody down with your words if they disagree with you. That's not what he's talking about. That's what the Pharisees used it for if they were around. Uh, the understanding here is that we would contend, stand by the faith, not back down from a fight, but rather in the fight, glorify God. Well, there's a way to fight to glorify God. And it's not your fist. Now, if somebody's invading your home, uh, I think God gives us full permission to take that person out. Thank you. Somebody said it. We are perfectly within God's right, uh, uh, will to protect our family. All right, not, not necessarily our own lives, but the family that we so love and been called to steward and called to love and to take care of. We are well within that rights. And I say that because I don't want you to misunderstand what we're going to say about our why today. I don't want you to think that I'm talking about backing down and being a sissy and just taking every lump that comes to you. The Bible tells us that Jesus stood here in this passage this episode stood and was accused and was uh, antagonized by the Pharisees who were contending for their faith. They were antagonizing him, and he stood. He didn't run from the fight. He stood, and he contended for the faith in a way that we need to do. Why did he contend for it? And that's because he was there at the synagogue not to cause a problem, but to glorify his Father. What's your why? What's your why? The passionate one was Jesus. This, these other ones were fighting for a possession. This morning, we're going to learn major, uh, some major differences uh, between both sides. And, and I know, Faithway, you're ready to learn, right? If you're ready to learn, either say amen or give a clap. Just if you're ready, I want to know if you're ready. Let's get into this. You may have known this. You may have grown in this. But now let's kind of organize it together. Ready? We're going to read and we're going to learn uh, uh, which side to be on. I think we already know, right? We know which side wins. Jesus wins all the time. Here, I want us to understand that we have two different fractions, and the first one is coming and gathering together for their possession. Go back to me in verse uh, 9 in your text. Let's read what it says. It says, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. Now, this may just mean the synagogue in that area, but I personally believe that, that God is helping us understand that these people possessed that synagogue. Now, my three girls are very awesome, and they don't regularly fight. You may know them. In fact, I know everybody here knows them. I've been around them. You know how sweet they are. And Emma is rambunctious. Annie is just that a strong leader type person. Cassie's the lovey-dovey makeup girl. But uh, she just loves putting makeup on right now or letting Luna and Giselle put makeup on her. And I love it. I love each and every one of their characters. But if you've grown up in a, in a house with more than one sibling, uh, and even just with one son or daughter, you'll know that they tend, they tend to think that they own everything. And the thing that our kids are combatant about most. In fact, it happened this morning. They think they own 
the back seat of my car. This morning, it was great. The first one in the car was Emma. I thought I was so sure, shocked. I was amazed. Emma's ready to go. She's ready to go to church. All right, I'm thankful. My daughter wants to go praise Jesus in Sunday school and wants to go thank God for that. No, she got in there, she sat down, and then as soon as uh, Annalisa comes around the corner, opens the door, she says, nope, this is my side. Get in the other side. And I thought, what is going on? I knew what was going on. If you know kids, if you were a kid, you know what's going on. They're fighting over which seat is theirs. It's their seat. They're possessing it. Right? And this is something that happened. Now, they have devised a beautiful structure. And I've read different articles and I've read books on raising kids. And, and, and I've learned a little, uh, some things. Some say uh, that you need to uh, make it their seat. You say, this is your seat. This is your seat. Divide it up between them and make it theirs. You need to clean it up. You need to take care of it. You need to do this. I think that's great. But I just don't have the uh, uh, mental uh, fortitude just to enforce it every time they get in the car. My wife, maybe, but not me. Uh, and, and so the other ones have said, just, just let them be. They'll grow out of it. Just let them, let them get, go through that, argue, go through all that kind of stuff and, and beat each other up, all that kind of stuff. Just, just you know, moderate it from time to time. And, and I thought, well, I'm just not going to let the kids just be there, think that they own the thing. I, I've come up, they've come up with a plan, and I think this is a great middle ground and something I'm going to initiate uh, is that uh, when they come to the car, this is their idea, by the way, when they come to the car, the first one in the car gets in that seat. The second one gets in the middle seat. The third one gets in the last seat. Now, I kind of want to change that up, Annalisa. I want the last one to get in the middle. Why? Because nobody likes the middle. You may like the middle because you're a middle child, but uh, nobody likes the middle. So they're fighting over which seat, and I'm thinking, man, do they not understand that the title does not read Annalisa Cassidy and Emma Welch. The title of this car reads David and Heather Welch. And by God's grace, we're able to pay the thing off, and it's ours. We own it. I can say, you sit here, you sit here, and you sit here, or get out. So they come to the car with the attitude of, I possess this. This is my possession. Now, toys and different things like that, I get. It's their possession. It was given to them and their money that was given to them. It's not mine. It's theirs. We're just helping them steward that. Now, if they break a toy, uh, sometimes I'll fix it. But other times I'll just say, it's junk. Throw it away. Right? It's, we give some direction. But when we come to the area where we think we possess something that is not ours, we are gathering for a wrong reason. Now, I get this. When you came, became a member of Faithway Baptist Church, I, I believe it may have been said by me or somebody else that you now need to take some ownership in the membership of this church. Now, understand, when we say that, uh, we're not saying you own the church, but rather you are responsible to be a good steward of where God has called you. So you, when you come, I don't want you to own an area of this church. God doesn't want you to come and say, this is mine. No, we come and say we are his. So the Pharisees were coming to this area. Look at what they said. Jesus, the, the Bible records this. This is their synagogue. It's the people's synagogue. The, church, the other church uh, in Revelation that is called their church is the church of Laodicea. In fact, the name means the church of the people. The people's church. There's one car manufacturer out there that means the people's car. It's called Volkswagen. And it was used as a propaganda for Hitler to rise to power. All right? We don't want the people's church. Do you want the people's church? We want Jesus' church. And so the Pharisees were coming and saying, this is my church. This is my gathering. The Pharisees came together and they said, this is my seat. I'm not going to clean up, but, you know, that crumb right there, that's your crumb. It's in my seat. I saw you eating that the other day, and it, 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 that, those potato chips, it's in my seat. Get it out of my seat. They were very possessive. And he goes on, our text today goes on to say that then there was a man that came with a withered hand. We don't know what he thought about the synagogue. We don't know why he gathered. We do know he gathered. What we understand about him is he needed some help. Now, I think it's very interesting that they chose this man to say, to tempt Jesus. Look at how they tempted Jesus. They didn't ask him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Because they wanted to know the answer. These were know-it-alls. They thought they already knew the answer. In fact, 
I believe that they went into this to get into a place, or to get Jesus into a catch-22. You know what I'm talking about? No matter what he said, he was condemned. Because they possessed the church. They possessed the doctrine. They possessed the traditions. They possessed the place. They possessed the people. And Jesus was teaching them the truth that uprooted all of that. And so they asked, not because they wanted the man to be healed, not because they wanted God to be glorified, but because they wanted to condemn and possess. Look at how they did it, that they might accuse him. It didn't matter how Jesus answered. The world works this way with Christianity as well, still today. They're going to ask you a question to try to get you in a catch-22. Why do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? It's a very good question, isn't it? If you know the answer, the answer is because the Bible says so. Well, that's circular reasoning. So what? Why do you believe in evolution? Because a scientist said so? The scientist, where did he get his information? From his brain? I don't know about you, but he's probably wrong about more than one or two things. I know God has always been right. I know the Bible has always been uh, truthful. The Bible has never changed. The Bible is settled forever in heaven. Hey, that's circular reasoning, fine. But it's proved itself to be the Word of God. They will try to catch you in a catch-22. And we can say, okay. Jesus, look, at his response wasn't one of possession. Uh, in fact, he did possess it. It's his. That man that they're talking about was his creation. The, the people accusing him was his creation. And, and he, he went on and gave him a good illustration. Jesus says, basically, I'm here for passion, not for possession, although he is the one who possesses it all. Uh, Ephesians 5.23, I quoted it just a minute ago. Even as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. See, Jesus comes into this church when we meet. And, and he looks at us and he ministers to us as his possession. You and I do not possess the church. I am worried for churches around the world. I'm worried for churches in America because there is too much my church and not enough. This is the Lord's. I can be worried about Faithway too. I'm worried about myself because sometimes my verbiage says that I think I own a part of this church. Don't look at me like that. You do the same thing. When you invite somebody to church, what do you say? Hey, come to... I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Just understand that we can get to the place where we possess it. If we were to change something, okay, we've, changed, we've used some new songs lately. Oh, all right, let's step on some toes. Uh, we've used some new songs lately. The question isn't, are my songs being played or sung? The question is, am I, isn't, am I being encouraged and lifted up? The question is, does that song lift Christ? Is that song being sung out of a passion for Jesus? Or is that song being sung out of a possession? For my. Now let's be honest, there's some old songs and new songs that shouldn't be sung in church. But let's get real today. And say, are we here because we want to possess or we, we are possessed by the Lord of Lords and King of Kings? The Pharisees wanted to possess the church. They wanted to possess the traditions. They wanted to possess everything. I want us to understand that God wants us to give Jesus the glory. We're not perfect. He wants us to come and worship Him who is perfect. When we give our best for Jesus, It should be out of passion. When we give our best attitude. How many understand that an attitude can go a long way anywhere you go? I've heard it said, aptitude 
is not the determination of altitude in life, but attitude is the determination of al altitude, meaning how far you get. Can I say this? In the, in the believer's life, your attitude of being Christ's child should be one of joy and peace and caring and compassion and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and meekness and temperance and love. Against such there is no law. Our attitude should show that we know that this is His and we are going to work as if it is His. I just, you know, just stop and say thank you right now to those who come to church with a great attitude. I know sometimes we need a cup of coffee to get there, but that's why we have cups of coffee. All right? And I'm thankful that you come in with a great attitude. Hey, can we stop and say thank you to some of the teens that have a great attitude this morning? Yeah, yeah. Give them a round of applause. A great attitude. Uh, what is the joke, the running joke around the world? It's not just in America. It's not just in, uh, in California. The running, uh, 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 if you're going to put a stigma on something, the running stigma is that teens have bad attitudes. Right? Can we say thank God for the ones that have good attitudes? That have their mindset rather on glorifying God and, and having passion for God than possessing, this is my phone, Right? I don't care what you do. I'm not going to smile. This is my face. It's not going to crack a smile unless I want it to. And it's only going to crack a smile when I watch somebody get hit in the growing. Somebody got to laugh at that. Somebody did. Annalisa did. Thank you, Annalisa. Good attitudes go a long way. Listen, when we glorify God, when we want, uh, when we are moved by a passion of knowing that He saved us and how He saved us and what He saved us from, we give our best attitude, we give our best uh, effort, we give our best mental aptitude, we give our best singing voice, even if we don't like the song. We give our best. Why? Because He's worthy. We give our best attention. Because the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, all were dead. He loved us so much. Look at what he did to this man. The response he gave to the Pharisees is phenomenal. He, re he responded, of course, perfectly. He's Jesus. But he responded in a way that, not, that wasn't just theological. It was practical. He responded in a way that everybody... in if one of the mature sheep fall in the ditch, aren't you just going to reach down and pick it up? Pick it up. You know what? I, I did a squat or deadlift the other day. Uh, I believe it was Friday. Deadlift Friday. And, and I had 205 pounds on that thing. And I reached down and I picked it up. And my legs said, ah! That was a female sheep. One of them. He's saying, if you're going to take the effort to care for your investment on the Sabbath day, the day you were told not to work, you're going to pick up 205 pounds? Is, isn't it good? How, how, look what he says next. How much better is a man than a sheep? What is your why for gathering? Is your why gathering because this is yours? Because this is God's? Is your why gathering because you want to have contention or you want to see conversions? What's your why? Sometimes we come to church wanting a conflict. Jesus came to church wanting to praise God. The Pharisees came to church wanting to produce some conflict. And I love what Jesus does. He doesn't back down from the conflict. He doesn't. Instead, he responds to the conflict in kind. There was a woman who called in to the Seattle um, animal licensing. Because in Seattle, if you own uh, more than three animals, three cats or dogs, uh, uh, you have to be classified as a kennel. You have to get a kennel license. So she called in and she asked the lady, she says, well, I'm engaged to a guy, we're going to get married. I have, I have two cats and a dog, and he has uh, two dogs and a cat. Is there any way that we can register the dogs and cats under our own names? And so that way we don't, get a, uh, uh, we don't have to get a kennel license. And, and, and to which the, uh, the lady responded, she says, well, ma'am, are they going to live in the same uh, premises? Are they going to live on the same compound, the same house? And she said, yes. I said, well, then the law states that if you have more 
uh, than four an or three animals on a acre or on a land that is more than 20,000 square feet or less than 20,000 square feet, you need to get a kennel license. A long pause happened, and then finally the woman responded, I'm afraid you have just ruined a beautiful marriage. Click. You know what we have in our society? Something the Pharisees could understand, and something that people who care more about their animals than they do about people. You're not the only one who can care for a dog. She could have given the dog away. The Pharisees would care more. In fact, I wonder, being Jesus, knowing everything and knowing what people have done, I wonder if one of those Pharisees had to stop at the edge of his property and to a pit, see one of his animals down, and he had to pick it up out of the pit before he came and accused Jesus of healing on the Sabbath day. I wonder. We're not told in Scripture, but I just know Jesus that he probably did something that hit so close to home that they had to stop and think, do I really care more about my animal than people? Do I really care about my investment in people? These individuals caused a conflict because they wanted to possess it. Their why was, it's me. It's my ideology. It's my philosophy. It's my doctrine. It's my songs. It's my chair. It's my whatever. And Jesus said, it's not yours. You're not God-like. God had more compassion than you have. I love what Jesus does. Your why for gathering needs to be a godly effort. There is no effort for Jesus in healing the hand of the withered man, or the withered hand of the man. There was no effort. All he needed to do, in fact, all he said was reach forth, uh, bring your hand forth, and he brought it forth, and it was healed. It was restored his whole. Jesus, all he asked him to, he just asked him a question. Would you trust me to heal your hand? And he did it. It wasn't coming in and breaking the arm and bringing it back to where it needed to be. Maybe there was a lack of blood flow. It caused it to wither. I don't know. I don't know the, 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 the reason. But Jesus said, reach your hand forth. The people who had to pick their sheep up out of a ditch had to lift 99 to 305 pounds. All Jesus had to do was say, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Are you gathering because you want to possess? Are you more interested in your investment in, your, in the offering plate? Are you more interested in investing, uh, looking good in front of people? Or are you more interested in living out the gospel of Jesus Christ? Faithway, come on, let's go. Are we more interested in, in possessing this place? or letting Christ possess us. I want Christ to be the honor. I want Christ to be glorified, don't you? Our goal at Faithway is not to teach you to become so uh, theologically sound that you think yourself better than anybody else. There was nobody greater in theology than Jesus. And He didn't come to be served or to be ministered unto, but rather to minister. In fact, this is the purpose of Jesus' coming. The Son of Man came not to seek, uh, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Lord isn't slack concerning his promises, but as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word. Not willing that any should perish, but all come unto repentance. God used Peter to write this to the church. He's long suffering to us. Why? I believe because we get in this possessive mentality. Don't we? Come on, am I the only one? Um, the office that's here at the church, it was the pastor's office, right? Well, now if you go in there, it's just the office. And every once in a while I go in there and I think, what happened to my office? How come all this stuff is in here? What, what's going on in my office? And it's not my office. It's Jesus' office. Now, I want us to understand something here. This is something that Jesus does very plainly in this text. Jesus uses this text to help us understand that he did not come to become a theologian. He did not, he's already a theologian. He's the one who created it. He did not come to become a politician. He did not come to, to be served by people. He came to give the gospel of the kingdom of God to give his life a ransom for many, so that whoever puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they might be saved. The Pharisees thought the Messiah was going to be coming to free them from the persecution of Rome. The persecution only got worse. 
It only got worse. At Faithway, are you coming to church because you think it's going to give you an easy time in your life throughout the week? I'll be honest with you. I should be anyway, right? I'm a pastor. Let me be direct. If you come to church you, and you walk by faith and you take upon the yoke of Jesus Christ, your life will be easier because you know him. But it doesn't mean your circumstances are going to get lighter. We all age. We all have problems. If you have kids, Sunday mornings are not easy. It's not, it's not the funnest day of the week until you get to church and then you let them go for half an hour and yeah, they were, we're here. We're doing great. He wants your why to be him. Jesus is teaching us that your why should not be superiority. You should not try to be the alpha male in the church. You should try to be the most humble servant of the church. Now, when I talk about not owning a position, uh, uh, a place, here's what we want to understand, is that sometimes when we own a place and somebody comes and suggests something different, we immediately write it off because it's not theirs to tell us what to do. Instead, we just do it our own way. I do this a lot. I do this a lot. When it, This morning when I came in, um, instead of sitting and praying like I should have, uh, I started doing a bunch of stuff. Because that's me. I just do. I just want to get stuff done. I started lighting up the computers. I started getting all that stuff done before anybody else came in. Why? I don't know. I didn't. You know what? I could have done something better. Because do we really need the screens? No. But do we need Jesus? I had to stop and pray. Forgive me, Lord. Because this isn't mine. I want it to shine for you, Lord. But if I try to make it shine outside of you, and it's, not, and it's worthless. The Pharisees were trying to do God's work without God. And they were trying to rationalize their life rather than being justified by faith. Are you coming to rationalize your week, how you acted? Are you coming with a, humil a spirit of humility, knowing that you need to be justified by faith? And then when you get Get out of whack with God. You need to come back by faith and have him get you on the right path again. You need to be rational. You can rationalize your sin. You can do that all the day. Look what the Pharisees did at the end of this. Jesus healed their arm, hit this man's arm. And what most of the people would do is what? Praise the Lord. That man, I guarantee you, that man clapped. Because he hadn't clapped and who, who knows how long. He had to clap like this. But now he's clapping, whole, he's raising his hands, thanking Jesus. He's just praising the Lord. And, and, and these Pharisees, what did they do? They said, no, this isn't right. And they separated themselves from what God wanted uh, them to know and to learn and to grow in. They separated themselves because of their doctrinal stance. And they said, instead of praise Jesus and praise God, they said, let's destroy him. Let's destroy him. We need to be so careful that we don't come to church to try to rationalize our actions throughout the week. We need to come to church to be confronted about our actions throughout the week. Not by me, but by the Word of God. By the Holy Spirit of God. Now, this can happen throughout the week, by the way. Aren't you thankful that He doesn't wait till Sunday to correct you? He can do it immediately. I'm so grateful for our God who loves us enough to give us a spanking on Monday. Right? He chastens us. He loves us as a father loves a child. He, said, he doesn't want us to wait till just, just, uh, uh, just Sunday. But when we come to church on Sunday and we're confronted with a, a, a truth that we had, uh, we had either ignored or were struggling with throughout the week, we can either rationalize our actions like the Pharisees did. They had counsel together. What does that mean? They started talking theology. The Bible says this, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. And instead of interpreting it the way that God wanted them to interpret it, they rationalized their preconceived feeling, what they had already come to a conclusion of. They rationalized it and said, Jesus is wrong. Let me put it another way. The Pharisees wanted to become the Lord of the King of Kings. And when we come to church, sometimes, can we, let's just be direct with one another. Sometimes we can say, I don't like that. I don't like that truth that was preached. I don't like that truth that was given to me. I don't like that truth that that person said. 
I know it's truth, but maybe they interpreted it wrong. And we try to rationalize our way out of it. I know not you guys. You guys are perfect visiting from heaven, right? You guys are angels. The reality is, is that humanity, left to ourselves, will rationalize our fleshly living. Come on, I'm there. You're there. Jesus confronted them with the reality. And they rationalized it away. These are religious individuals contending for their faith. The problem with coming to an argument, believing that you're right, instead of you might be right, right? The, the, the problem of doing that is you eliminate the possibility that you're finite. What do I mean? You're fallible. That's you, me. I'm just us. We're fallible. We eliminate that when we come to an argument and say, no, I already know the answer. That's what the Pharisees did. We need to come to an argument with God and say, I think I'm right. But God, let me listen to you like I might be wrong. And when I get corrected, it may be that I need to change something dramatically in my life. Instead of taking counsel with people who agree with me, you know what one of these Pharisees could have done? They said, you guys go talk. I need to talk to this man who just healed that guy. Because I just picked those sheep up out of my ditch, and it was heavy. And Jesus just said, do you trust me to heal your hand? And he healed the hand. I need to talk to this guy. I need to know what's going on. And instead of catering to the conviction of God, he catered to the rationalization of his peers. We need to be so careful. Our world right now is gathering in many different places for many different whys. There are some that want to do an immense amount of good, but they don't know God, and they don't want God to be a part of their lives. There are many that are gathering today to try to make America great again. It's a great cause, wouldn't you say? But many are gathering in that realm trying to do it without God. The church is called to gather. Not because we are trying to rationalize our actions, but because we know we're sinners. And we know our tendencies. And we need Jesus. Jesus gathered because he wanted to glorify his Father. Because he wanted to live out the gospel. And he did. Do you trust me with your hand? You trust Jesus, he heals you. He didn't cause the fight, but he didn't back down from the fight. And he did, he did this fight in love. I love our Jesus. It's not our Jesus. He's Jesus. He's the God of the Bible. He's your Savior. And I tell you, if you haven't put your faith in Him, you need to put your faith in Him. Why did you come this morning? To please your parents? To fulfill a duty? To rationalize your actions? Or did you come to worship Jesus? One more illustration and I'm done. Charles, um, I have a, a, a screen up here. Many of you know this guy. How many of you know this guy just by looking at him? The Spirit of St. Louis, if I were to mention that, how many of you know who that is? Jack, you know? Some of you know. I remember reading um, books about this guy when I was a young individual. Not that I'm old, but when I was young, as a kid. A biography about Charles Lindenberg, right? Many of you may have heard about uh, the Lindenberg baby who was kidnapped as an infant and murdered. It was called the crime of the century. He's the man who made the first transatlantic flight from New York to Paris. First one. Uh, he was a hero of America. He, he was uh, in the Air Force. He fought in World War I. He actually uh, wanted to stay out of World War II, not because, as many thought, because he was, uh, he was a Nazi sympathizer, but in public he would definitely condemn the Nazis. It wasn't because he, wanted to go, he didn't want to go fight. It was because that he didn't think it was America's war. 
when Pearl Harbor happened, he took up his plane. In fact, he, the uh, President Eisen, uh, President, um, not Eisenhower, President uh, Roosevelt would not re-enlist him, would not uh, put him back at his rank of colonel uh, to, in World War II because of the supposed Nazi affiliation that he had. He just didn't want to fight. He didn't, want, he didn't think it was America. But when they bombed Pearl Harbor, even though he would not be able to join up with the Air Force, he got in his own plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, and he flow, flew to the Philippines, where he was credited for shooting down 15 different enemy fighters as a, as a citizen. By the end of the war, Eisenhower had reinstated him to Brigadier General of the United States uh, uh, Air Force. And, and as he was starting to uh, reflect on what had happened and how his uh, creation, as, as he was an aeronautic scientist, and how, how he helped the airplanes become and be developed uh, in, in America and around the world, he, he started to reflect on his work. And, and I want to quote this for you today. I don't, wanna, I, I don't want you to... Uh, 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 get this wrong. I want you to understand what his heart was at the end of his life as he won a, Pel a Pelzer Prize for this, this article that he wrote. He said, in my youth, science was more important to me than either man or God. I worshiped science. It was advanced. Its advance had surpassed man's wildest dreams. It took many years for me to discover that science, with all its brilliance, lights only the middle chapter of creation. Here's what he said. I saw the aircraft I loved destroying the civilization I expected it to save. He says, now I understand that the spiritual truth is more essential to a nation than the mortar in the city walls. For when the actions of a people are undergirded by spiritual truths, there is safety. I think that's pretty good. We would continue to say, the spiritual truths, when spiritual truths are rejected, it is only a matter of time before civilization will collapse. Can we attest to that in America in 2024? We understand the spiritual truths and, and apply them uh, to modern life. Uh, we must draw strength from, our, uh, from the almost forgotten virtues of simplicity, humility, contemplation, and prayer. It requires a dedication beyond science, beyond self, but the rewards are great, and it is our only hope. Can I summarize some of this for us? He's saying that my, my inventions were awesome. My inventions were awesome, but it didn't help our society. He's saying my work was important, but it ended up destroying civilization rather than building it because I didn't put God first. I came to my work with the why as being science and my go forward. But now I come to my work as saying, I want to glorify God. I want to glorify God. Why did we come? Why did we gather? The Pharisees came to condemn, to own and possess, to set us free. Where are we at? Where are we at today? We've got to ask ourselves that. We can't just look at another church and say, well, I'm not doing, we're not doing it that way because they're not doing it the way I think God wants us to do it. We can't do that anymore. We've got to come to church and say, am I here for him? Am I here for him? Or am I here for me? And I tell you, if you're only here for you, destruction is just a moment away. But if you're here for Jesus, it's going to help you. He's going to minister to you. He's going to heal you. And he's going to make Faithway an amazing place, better than it is now, to worship God. Are you here for him? Are we here for him, Faithway? Can we just say thank you, God, for giving us Faithway Baptist Church? Give him a, just take a round of applause. I know this is new to us, but let's thank God. Amen.